Hello, I'm Natali Rubbo. I'm a drone project manager in EASA. I will give you now an overview of the European regulatory framework on drones. Uh, in Europe, we decide to apply an operation-centric and risk-based approach. What does it mean? The risk of the operation depends where you are conducting the operation. So we identify three main categories, and what we called uh, open category, a specific category, and certified category. The open category is the, the, oper the, the category that are uh, considering all the operation where the risk is lower, where the operator uh, can conduct the operation without asking for an authorization. But the, we have some specific requirements. The specific category uh, is an operation that has a risk a bit increased from the open category, where the uh, operator needs to ask for an authorization before starting the operation. And the certified category are those operations uh, where the risk is compatible to, uh, comparable to what we have uh, for uh, managed aviation. And so we are using an approach that are more similar to our traditional uh, um, aviation system. Uh, I will give you now an overview of these three categories. Uh, at this moment, uh, the Commission published two regulations, uh, it is the regulation 2019, 945 and 947, that uh, provide the requirements, operational requirements and technical requirements for the operation classified in the open and specific category. Uh, this uh, regulation is applicable from 31st December 2020 in all European member states. Uh, then uh, for the certified category, the, uh, we are working on it and uh, the first proposal that we call MPA, Notice of Proposal Amendment, will be uh, available by beginning of next year. So let's see uh, what is the open category. The open category uh, is uh, an operation that where the risk is very, uh, very low because there are, we provide some prescriptive requirements such that the operator is just allowed to buy the drone, register himself, so not register the drone, but register himself, train, and then he can fly. And in order to operate in the open category, uh, you always need to be in, uh, in a distance such that you can see the drone, so vision line of sight, at a height below on the 20 meter, and in general with a drone that is uh, lighter than 25 kilos. Uh, however, uh, we identify three subcategories in the open categories, and uh, uh, the drones that will be uh, op be possible to be operated in the open category uh, when it uh, has been bought in a, in a shop, they need to have a class mark that will be, uh, which requirements will be verified through the C marking process. That is the same process that today we are using for verifying compliance of requirements with uh, uh, the um, mass market product, like for example, a, a mobile phone. So we identified some new requirements uh, that will lead to uh, a, a class mark that may go from zero to four. So you go on the shop, you buy the drone, and then looking at the mark, you will know. If, for example, if your drone is marked zero or one, then uh, you are in the A1 subcategory, so you can fly over people uh, with, with very uh, little limitation. Uh, just avoiding to fly over crowds. And also this is applicable if you have a privately built drone with less than 250 grams. If instead the drone is Mark C2, means that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the drone has a weight of uh, up to four kilo, then you can still fly in the urban environments, but you need to fly up to uh, five meter or 30 meter from people, depending on the characteristic of your drone. And then lastly are drones in C3 or C4, uh, where you can fly only outside the city in an area where there is no one. And uh, you can also use in this uh, subcategory drones that are up to 25 kilos. When you want to do an operation that exceeds uh, these requirements in the open category, for example, at a distance high, um, longer than uh, visual line of sight or uh, in, uh, higher than 120 meters, uh, then you are in the specific category. So here we may have a different kind of operations uh, from very easy one that maybe the, those like, uh, for example, uh, farming uh, with a medium, small drone in an area that is uh, where there is no one, so a safe area, uh, or uh, for example, other operations that are more, more complex like urban delivery, for example, of, uh, of a package. So in this uh, case, uh, the regulation does not provide prescriptive requirements only provide uh, the 
methodology that the operator needs to uh, use in order to carry out a risk assessment in order to identify what are the uh, mitigation and the safety objective that the operator needs to put in place in order to make the operation safe. So in general, the process here is that after uh, you buy the drone, register yourself and then uh, carry out risk assessment and but apply then for an authorization to the competent authority and you can only do the operation after you receive the authorization. Uh, the methodology for risk assessment is published as an acceptable means of compliance with the regulation and is called SORA, Specific Operation Risk Assessment. Now, since uh, a risk assessment uh, requires some, uh, some effort and maybe also some skill to the operator, uh, we identified some level of simplification. The first one is the predefined risk assessment. Those are scenarios uh, where EAS identified the, the kind of operation, uh, identified, uh, carry out the risk assessment by ourselves, and then we identified what are the mitigation and the requirements that the operator needs to put in place in order to make the operation safe. So now we have just a table that the, the uh, operator can uh, use in order to identify the requirements and show compliance to the competent authority uh, uh, that so then uh, making sure that this operation is safe. So it will be simplified both for the operator and for the, the competent authority. Today we have four predefined risk assessments that has been published and we plan to publish more, actually to possibly to cover mostly the operation that will be conducted in Europe. Another kind of uh, simplification are the standard scenario. Those are some special or scenarios where the, uh, where the, the operation is safer, is, and uh, the requirements are easier to be implemented, such that uh, the operator can just declare to the competent authority that he can do the operation, so without asking for authorization. And the last is uh, uh, the light US AMAN certificate, that is a voluntary certificate that the operator may ask to the competent authority uh, to be granted by showing uh, that uh, they have a structure such that they can assess the risk of an operation and they can receive a privilege from the competent authority uh, that uh, may be different uh, depending on the level of maturity of the, the operator. And they can be up to uh, self-authorize all kinds of operations that are conducted by the operator. Uh, regarding the design, so the verification of the design uh, can be then conducted in different ways. So also here depends on the level of risk. So for the open category, I already told you about the C marking. Uh, uh, then uh, let's see first for the certified category that as I told you uh, is uh, uh, those kinds of operations that are similar in terms of risk to the manned aviation. And so we use a similar approach. So we are going to ask for a certificate according to part 21. Then for the specific category, following the risk assessment, uh, the operator can identify, a, let's say, a broader uh, classification between low risk, medium risk, and high risk. So in low risk, uh, the operator will be allowed uh, to just declare that the, the drone has been designed according to standards that are being then recognized by EASA, or may also use a drone with a C marking. Uh, for the high risk, you, these, uh, these risks are similar to those in the certificate category. So also here we ask for a, a certificate of according to part 21. However, in the next revision to part 21, we may identify some simplification. While for the medium risk, we decided that uh, the, the certificate according to part 21 is not appropriate and a new tool has been developed. And we call this design verification report uh, uh, where the operator uh, may require EASA to verify either the full design of the drone or only uh, some elements depending on what kind of operation because in some kinds of operation you don't need to have a, a drone that are fully compliant with all the requirements. Maybe you just show that uh, some system are enough to uh, ensure the safety of the operation and so EASA will only focus on that one. And uh, whoever can apply for design verification report, we don't mandate to have a design uh, organization approval. And EASA uh, will establish a list of design verification report on the uh, website where there will be the main information such that the, uh, the operator that's willing to do a new kind of operation, they can select 
uh, what, which one is the drone already uh, verified by ASA. And so in this case, we don't need to have an additional verification of the design of the drone. Now, we also consider that, uh, especially over urban environment, there will be a large number of operations that will be drones, but maybe also other kind of uh, manned aircraft. And uh, uh, the current uh, air traffic controller system may not be appropriate. So we need to have something new, something that uh, will be automatized. And so uh, a new regulation uh, developing a, a, a new system that we call U-Space was uh, published uh, this year, and this is regulation 2021-664 that will become applicable from 26 January 2023. So the use space will be a set of services that will be deployed firstly in the area where there will be uh, more operations, so most, we expect mostly in the urban area, but then little by little will maybe uh, then cover also other area, where uh, some services that are mandatory will be uh, provided, like network identification, uh, the geo-awareness to provide information to the uh, operator if there are areas that uh, cannot be uh, flown by drones, uh, traffic information, and uh, US flight authorization. Then there will be other uh, optional service that will be the monitoring service and the weather service. So there will be service provider that will be, uh, very, will be uh, assessed and uh, authorized by the HNAA, and uh, the operator, before starting the operation in that area, needs to connect to the service provider and then use all these services. Uh, then let's give a look to the future. Uh, this is uh, uh, the industrial developments that we um, identified uh, also by interviewing uh, the European drone, in drone industry. So we see that today we already have uh, some kind of operation uh, that are beyond the China site, but at this moment, most of them are in corridors, so they are not uh, free routes. So these are what we classify more or less in the medium risk of the specific category, and these are already defined by the regulation that, uh, that we have for the specific category. Uh, uh, we see that uh, operation instead uh, that will be in the free route, so for urban delivery, are coming. So this is something that uh, will be, we think, in, in the next months. And uh, the, the, the current regulation uh, on the specific category already provides all the elements to allow this kind of operation. However, especially for the design part, we would like to have uh, some adjustment, and you will see next slide. And then in, uh, by 2025, we, uh, we know that we will start to have urban air mobility, so aerotaxi, for example. We know that at the beginning, the aerotaxi will be with the pilot on board. So you see that uh, we call type three operation those that are manned urban air mobility, and then later, by the end of the decades, we may have aerotaxi without a pilot on board. And lastly, uh, by 2035, we may have uh, another kind of operation that are uh, uh, cargo international flight uh, that are um, like normal uh, uh, operation like we have today, like cargo operation, but without a pilot on board. So in order to, uh, to con cater with, uh, for uh, this um, possible plan of the future, we identified uh, our rulemaking activities. So uh, we, are, uh, uh, we published uh, before the summer a, in a change to the acceptable means of compliance and guidance material to the specific category. Uh, and we are going to publish the decision by uh, the end of the year. However, we will continue to, uh, to update uh, the, this information, providing some guidelines. Uh, regarding the use space, we publish an acceptable means of compliance and guidance material as, an, as a proposal. Uh, we will go to publish by the end of the year, and one year later, we are going to then issue the decision. While instead, for the certificate category, by beginning of next year, we will publish a proposal that will provide those uh, adjustments uh, for the design for the specific category in a risk and to also to allow operation with uh, uh, manned aerotaxi, so manned UIM. Uh, while instead, uh, in 2023, we are going to provide a, another proposal where we are going to address the aerotaxi without a pilot on board and the cargo international fair rule. One year later to the, uh, to the proposal, there will be the EASA opinion where we will propose to the, uh, to the commission a change to the regulation. 
So all this information that I gave you uh, are on our website. Here you see the, the, uh, the link. You can find all the documentation with uh, the regulation, the accepted means of compliance, but also videos and presentation that explain the regulation and frequently ask questions. So I, I invite you to, uh, to uh, subscribe to the, to the website in order to receive information. So I hope that uh, uh, this information were useful and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>